Hey everyone, welcome to another Ruby Rogues. I'm David Kimura, and today on our panel we have Andrew Mason. Hello. And then we are interviewing Elia Shito. Thanks for having me. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, and some of the things that you're working on. So I'm a Ruby developer for, I think, 12 plus years. Right now, I started in 2006. And uh, I always loved uh, Ruby. And uh, around 2011, I had to write some big chunk of JavaScript for the time, of course. And I miss Ruby so much, I went looking for Ruby to JavaScript translators or compilers. And that, at the time, that was the coffee script time. And I found this little project, Opal. I started contributing and now I'm the main maintainer. So that, that's my main uh, of work uh, endeavor. Yeah. So for those who don't know what Opal is, can you give a high level overview of what it is, its purpose and some different use cases? Yeah, of course. Opal is a source-to-source uh, compiler. It translates to plain JavaScript. Uh, it's basically a compiler like you, you have for ES6 uh, or CoffeeScript uh, or TypeScript. Uh, you can use it just to write your front-end applications. One of the many good things of Opal is that uh, it compiles uh, basically keeping the, um, as much as JavaScript as it can. So, for example... Uh, yeah. Any method will go to a function and classes are mapped to prototypes. And uh, the same goes for modules. Uh, module prepend and include are supported. Basically, the whole core library is, uh, is present there and a great bunch of the standard library. Cool. So where in the application would you actually have it? So I know with... You have like JavaScript assets. So in your JavaScript folder, would you just have a whatever dot RB instead of a JS file? Yeah, in the usual race uh, app, let's say mostly with the sprockets version of uh, race assets, assets, you would have uh, an application dot JS dot RB that will uh, require Opal. That's a runtime as the first thing. And then uh, you can require both JavaScript and other .js, .rb files or .rb files that resides in your application assets uh, JavaScript folder. So it's basically like having another small uh, Ruby application, small or big, of course, in your uh, assets JavaScript uh, folder. That's uh, the easiest uh, way. And uh, of course, we also have support for JavaScript uh, and there's a whole project dedicated to supporting uh, React, that's called the uh, Hyperloop. And uh, there's a bunch of uh, projects and front-end frameworks uh, and um, similar React uh, virtual DOM uh, implementations. Uh, but you can go any way you want. The, the great and lovely thing, at least for me, is that you can still do your beloved Ruby. Cool. So when does it actually get compiled down into JavaScript? Is it at runtime or does it do it when you do like a Rails assets pre-compile? Yeah, um, the completion happens uh, during the pre-compile. So the um, deployed uh, code is just JavaScript. It will be performant and efficient. It won't, won't need to have uh, some kind of interpreter in, in the browser. And actually... Completion sizes are not that big, uh, are really small, especially if you want to trim down some 
libraries from the core library. You can do that and uh, reduce even even more. I had some um, users reporting that they actually reduced their their application bundle size by switching to Opal because uh, using the core library and Ruby's uh, methods like enumerable stuff, they were uh, able to cut out uh, a bunch of uh, JavaScript libraries that were used just for small things. Because that's the way NPM goes with uh, super small libraries, but that is a price uh, as well. So I've looked at Opal before, and I think I was trying to convert Ruby into JavaScript, but now I'm looking at it again, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So what is like the main reason you would use Opal? Is it just to avoid having to write JavaScript, having to avoid to bring in certain JavaScript dependencies, et cetera? So, well, the main reason will be the same reason I will use uh, Ruby on the server, and that uh, Ruby is such an expressive and concise and beautiful language. Of course, I should mention also that uh, I would also be able to reuse all my object-oriented design skills and practices and testing and all that stuff. But basically, it's so so better to write Ruby than JavaScript. And don't get me wrong, I love JavaScript. I wrote a, so much JavaScript uh, working on Opal and on client projects. I've recently wrote some TypeScript and uh, every time with all the value all those projects have, including JavaScript, Ruby is so much better, at least for me. So it's basically a way to kind of use the niceties of Ruby and avoid having to jump into JavaScript. I guess, what would you say to the people who are like, why why can't you just use JavaScript? Like, what what's the pitch? If I, as a junior developer, I, I'll come around and say this, I am not good at JavaScript at all. It's very, very hard for me to wrap my head around it, I guess. Whereas Ruby is, like you said, it's a beautiful, easy to understand language. I'm just, in my head, I'm thinking, if I were to go to my managers and say, I want to use Opal in this project, I feel like the first thing they would say is, why can't you just learn JavaScript? And I'm curious, I guess, as to if you've experienced um, people in the community kind of bringing this up, like, it, could you just learn JavaScript? Why do we need this entire library around it? Yeah, you should learn JavaScript anyway. That's, that's the first advice I would, would give. Oh. Uh, as you should learn uh, at least some JavaScript if you're in the in the web game, at le- uh, let me say, you should know about that. Even when using Opal, uh, you m- must remember you're not using Rails. That's uh, Ruby and not Rails. It's basically using Ruby in a different domain. And you should know the, the handles of that domain. So you should know about the DOM, you should know about uh, uh, the CSS OM, or the things that go go around in the browser and all that stuff. Uh, it's not removed for, from you. You still have to, to know it. Uh, that goes for events, uh, all that stuff. But all that being said, your productivity will probably be much better with a language like, like Ruby. So for example, in a recent project, we were able to mimic some kind of uh, Redux with just using message dispatching. So we, uh, the project was not probably Facebook's chat or something like that. Uh, it's what, it was not very small, but not too big. Basically, we had um, just a module that had a bunch of methods, methods on it and would uh, uh, mutate the, um, the application state. And uh, we clean, cleaned up all the things we were facing, all the problems we were facing with that kind of uh, solution. So we, we were able to reuse the basic concept of Redux much more, much better and cleaner and shorter and more understandable way. Let me add, sometimes I'm, I'm a bit of a, I have some difficulties uh, selling Opal just for, for this because it's basically selling Ruby. There's a whole uh, using the right tool for the job thing that goes on, but setting apart the thing that most uh, use of JavaScript nowadays is compiled anyway. So it's not a matter of that. 
as a problems and you're bringing in a bunch of libraries just to support your everyday things like underscore or any of those libraries that's all stuff that's solved basically solved in ruby and solved in a, in a very clean way you know all the things you you should do and the result is uh, as wise poignant guide would say you almost can read that in english and i just love it yeah i like what you said about productivity because you're right i will be infinitely more productive in ruby than i will be in javascript and if you're plugging on a project that you need to get out quickly or you're doing a proof of concept it does kind of make sense to increase your velocity by not having to dip your hand into a language that you know you will be hindered by in terms of speed. That's a, a great point. And uh, that's my first hand experience. And uh, I have that uh, from users as well. Yeah, I really need to give Opal a second look because I, like Andrew and probably like many people, try to avoid writing JavaScript. With the exception of something like Stimulus, I found Stimulus to be very easy, even though it is still JavaScript, just their approach to it, I found it to be really easy to work with. But there's still a lot of the unknowns when working with Stimulus or other JavaScript libraries. So have you guys tested out Opal with Webpacker to see if it integrates in nicely? And then also with something like Stimulus to kind of just play around to see if that works and the kind of things it can output? Yeah, I still have to try that on Stimulus. And about Webpacker, uh, it's it's a work in progress. It's both done and a work in progress. So there's this um, uh, contributor that came out with a a fork with a couple of modifications for supporting uh, uh, Ustrict, for those who knows what that that is. And... uh, in uh, in order to get to Opal working with uh, Webpacker. Uh, of course, the thing was uh, use strict and uh, ES6 modules. The work in progress part is uh, that we're bringing that uh, to the core and uh, giving official support, especially with the release of uh, Ray 6. That's, of course, uh, the first priority right now. About stimulus, I would like to add this. The most recent project I was working on, it was actually a bunch of sites uh, similar one to the other. We were using a mini, really like 50 lines of Ruby framework for dealing with uh, JavaScript, uh, with uh, jQuery, adding some sprinkles, uh, some JavaScript sprinkle, as they say, to the page. It was incredibly similar to what Stimulus does. So basically, we had these uh, modules. Each uh, module would uh, uh, declare a CSS scope they would work on and uh, catch all the events within that scope, some uh, methods to change its internal state. And then uh, usually we added a render method that would use uh, jQuery to mutate the DOM according to the state. And that was... uh, really, really easy and allowed us to clean up uh, all the old uh, jQuery code we had. Yeah, that's cool. Most of the applications I work on the side right now are Rails 5.2 or above. So I would definitely be interested in tracking Opal to see when the Webpacker support comes out. Yeah, I was wondering, so you mentioned, um, was it Hyperloop earlier? I think they've changed to Hyperstack now. I could be totally wrong. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. Um, I was just curious if you could explain what that is real quick, if you don't mind. Someone on Twitter, I guess, reached out to me mentioning this project and suggesting I use it. And it's like I literally have it on my list of things I want to play with because it looks really cool. Yeah, but basically, some years ago, uh, a project called the Reactor B started. It was basically... Uh, or less a wrapper around uh, React uh, to use it uh, with uh, Opal and uh, to have uh, classes for components and all that jazz. With the years, uh, that project expanded and uh, reached uh, the level, let me say, of, of a framework. It 
it has integrations with uh, Active Record. Uh, I tried it a couple of times with the experiments, but I don't think I reached all the features it has uh, and the and its capabilities. And covers, uh, I think, uh, from specs uh, to models uh, to synchronization and and connections, like from ten sockets and that stuff. Cool. You all recently released a pretty big version of Opal, am I correct? Yeah, we finally went with uh, 1.0. It was something uh, I was expecting and working on for years. Actually, that's something I would have done uh, like in 2012, probably, because uh, that's the year I started uh, using it in production. So as a Samver fan at the time was just Samver was was just uh, released and published. I thought, oh, this is already one oh. We're using it it in production and there's people relying on it. But at the time it wasn't uh, the case and so we waited until uh, a sufficient uh, level of the language features and core library were implemented. What I mean by that is that we are now passing, I think, uh, more than 11,000 examples uh, from the Ruby spec. And that's the same spec used by CRuby uh, or MRI, as you want to call it, or, and uh, Truffle and also JRuby. So I, I think uh, we are uh, in a great place uh, right now. As I said, the, the next step is uh, Webpacker support, although we, we already had it but uh, let's say official uh, support. There's uh, a couple of things more I would like to introduce uh, with, uh, with newer versions. One big thing uh, is dead code elimination because I'm, I'm quite sure we, we will be able to remove a bunch of the methods you, you don't use from the core library. For example, if you have an application that never uses uh, some enumerable methods like, uh, I don't know, Tuenum, it's used pretty pretty rarely, I think. All those methods you don't use and no none of your dependencies use, I think we should just keep uh, their definition. And with that, I'm um, quite sure we, we will be able to reduce uh, even more the size of the bundle. Another thing I like to mention is that I like to add back mutable strings because right now Opal uh, uses uh, maps uh, Ruby strings to JavaScript strings and they're basically frozen. That was uh, really uh, in line with the with the program set by Mats on Ruby three when it, it introduced the literary uh, what, what's it called. Literally frozen string. Frozen strings, literal. Yeah. I have the shortcut in the editor. I don't remember it. I never remember it. So anyway, that's the same as using that. And uh, so any string in Opal is uh, frozen. And so that means you can't use uh, methods like uh, gsub with the exclamation mark. That initially is a bit of a surprise for someone, but it's uh, easy to get by and... Uh, you get used uh, to it pretty quickly. That said, I think mutable strings would be a good addition because there are cases in which uh, you can do things uh, with a, basically that's a string builder. We will be able to support uh, much more gems and libraries uh, directly without um, much modifications. So one thing that I think was really cool, and it was a question I was going to ask you, but I found the answer just on opalrb.com, is I wanted to see what kind of JavaScript it would produce. So under the try button, once you go to the site, you can actually put in some Ruby code, and there are some examples that you can click on, and then you can see the output that it generates, so you can verify that it's working, and then you can also see the compiled JavaScript that it generates. So is there a way that you can hook this into your CI, CD, so it can be one of the tests to compile so that you're not shipping to production something that's going to fail on the assets pre-compile? Or is it something that you can run locally to verify that it's going to 
generate the proper JavaScript? So uh, the way you would use um, the Opal compiler would be to just write your RB files in assets JavaScript and then rely on um, on sprockets or webpacker to compile them and just refresh your page uh, as you do with uh, any other JavaScript compiler or uh, basically using uh, JavaScript uh, directly. Maybe you mean uh, using something like uh, ESLint or that kind of stuff uh, in the CICD? Yeah, Dave, I wasn't entirely sure. Could you reword that question? Yeah, he answered it, that in the development cycle, you can refresh your page and then it's going to then compile the Ruby code into JavaScript. So if there is any kind of runtime errors or anything, you would see it immediately. And I assume that something similar like that exists in the CICD pipeline, where you can have it run the Rails assets pre-compile, and you're supposed to get an exit code zero or something. Just to make sure that if you go to ship it to production, you're not actually shipping broken code. Yeah, of course. Uh, the assets precompile uh, already does that. And uh, in addition to that, uh, any Capybara with JavaScript enabled tests you, you can have or spec will uh, fully check your code. Because uh, if you run the page with JavaScript enabled and test things out, uh, you, you will get the errors as, as you will do with any JavaScript uh, compiler, basically. I also tried to use in the past... Uh, Opal spec, which is uh, uh, one of the projects uh, we have on the um, on the main organization, w- which is uh, currently kind of broken with the uh, specs. Uh, we're trying to run the original specs of uh, spec, but it's a very complex uh, project. Anyway, w- what I wanted to say is that uh, it's a bit more difficult if you run um, jQuery JavaScript or that kind of JavaScript to test things out. So uh, I eventually ended up uh, using just Capybara. Of course, uh, uh, if you instead you're using any kind of components uh, and more isolated things, uh, that will be great that you could add uh, any kind of JavaScript testing uh, library you want and test things out. It's actually pretty easy to call JavaScript code, uh, I mean, sorry, Opal uh, Ruby code from JavaScript because the mapping is... Uh, very easy to understand and to, uh, in fact, uh, I I use um, Opal from the console all the time uh, when debugging things and uh, that's super easy. You just have to learn a couple of things and then you're good to go. So what's on the roadmap ahead of you? I know you touched on this a little bit, but is there anything else you want to add? Of course, uh, we're always uh, uh, looking into ways to increase our coverage of the core and standard library. So uh, if anyone, let me do a, a little plug here. If anyone wants uh, some katas, Ruby and JavaScript and want to improve uh, their skill in those languages, Opal, I think it's the perfect project. So uh, w- what it tempests would be that uh, you download the project, uh, run being set up and install the dependencies. And then you can basically pick any of the filtered out uh, specs. For example, there may be a, a small case with any of the co-library methods. And you go there and you implement the, them in Ruby or JavaScript, depending on the performance level and importance on the, of that method. So there's a bunch of things. And uh, I learned so much Ruby doing this that I will never have known otherwise. I think the same goes for the JRuby people and uh, any implementer. You learn all the uh, little uh, features, mostly unknown methods and uh, options that you had there, and you're way less surprised. That goes also for language features like constant lookup, retry keyword, and ensure all the things Ruby you'll improve your your knowledge about the language doing this. That said, other than that, I think uh, the first thing is a strict mode and webpack. And then uh, uh, I might reevaluate that. Uh, also listen to feedback uh, 
but I think that code elimination, that's something that came up in the past uh, and mutable string would be to good, um, to good uh, aims. And of course, uh, we also have, um, as I said, Ruby is uh, still releasing, luckily. The new features will be ported back as they come, uh, came, come out. And uh, I think that uh, will provide uh, material for new releases as long as uh, Ruby lives. So those are basically the main uh, aims. Uh, that goes uh, just for the core compiler. And uh, as I mentioned, we, we also have uh, gems for uh, Opal jQuery, Opal RSpec, and uh, a bunch of the Opal Haml, which I, and, and Opal ERB, which I enjoyed using uh, so much in the past because I was able to share templates with the backend and uh, little pieces of code for small calculations were, was really useful. So what's been the general feedback and acceptance of Opal? Being uh, an open source project with uh, no subscription, so we can look at the download co- count. But other than that, it's a question I think uh, any open source maintainer would like to have an answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, jokes apart. Yeah, I think the, there has been um, a niche of users interested in that there is some pushback on what we t- we touched on before. Like, is this the right tool for the job? Is this uh, the thing you want to do in the browser? Is it right? Some scary mongering, <laughs> let me say, of that kind. Of course, I don't want to belittle any project that doesn't use uh, Opal uh, with a race backend. Far from that, of course. Right now, I'm working on a project that uses uh, TypeScript. That's fine. Uh, it depends on the people you have on the project, the number of developers. There are many things that goes into the project. But of course, uh, I, I think it's uh, a project that would, uh, if it was tried by more Ruby developers, we would end up with great innovations and great new libraries. Some of those we, we already have, of course, as a bunch of, as I said, a bunch of frameworks for, for Opal. But the power of Ruby that gave us uh, Capybara, RSpec, and projects like GitHub, the expressiveness uh, of it, uh, I think, will, can, can do the great good on the front-end side of things. I don't worry too much on the number of users. In the same sense that uh, any early adopter of uh, Ruby will not worry about the number of users compared to Java and to... I don't know, PHP that were great at the time and still are, of course. Since I do Ruby, I will try to think with my mind and evaluate uh, any project uh, on its own. I think also it's a perfect fit for smaller teams or smaller old Ruby full stack developers teams. If you have a front end department, it will probably be more difficult to introduce. But if you're a Ruby developer, that's a a really great way to go. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about a great system that I just found that has made my life a ton easier. That's Cloud 66. A lot of folks think that deploying is a pain. I kind of grew up as an ops guy, and so I never really felt that way until I tried Cloud 66 and realized that the way that I was doing it with Capistrano, pushing stuff up to DigitalOcean, it really was kind of a pain. And when things didn't work, I had to go in and I had to bang my head against the wall to figure it out. Plus, all the setup stuff was just a big headache. And what I found with Cloud 66 is that it's a really nice way just to get everything set up. I just told it I had a Rails app, and off it went. It set it all up, it does the deployment, and now that I have other developers working with me on PodWrench, which is what I'm using it for here, all I have to do is give them access, and then they can go push the button for me, and it gets deployed. It's really nice, it's straightforward, It has all of my environment variables in it, so I didn't have to do any setup that way either. I just had to go in, put in my AWS credentials and a few other things that I was using for third-party apps, and it set it up and ran it. So if you're looking for a great solution for deployments, use the promo code RubyRogues, that's all one word, capital R, capital R, RubyRogues, for $66 off Cloud66. This only works for new users, but man, it is awesome, so go check them out, cloud66.com. 
Yeah, looking on the dependency graph, it looks like there are 1,200, a bit over 1,200 repositories that have included Opal. So I know a lot of these are kind of like example applications and stuff, but there are some legitimate ones that are using Opal. So it's kind of cool cool to see there. And, you know, honestly, I think that Opal, much like anything else, is going to be a matter of preference. Some people will absolutely avoid writing JavaScript at all costs, and some people will find alternatives. I mean, look at Rails just a few years ago. It introduced and was heavily relying on CoffeeScript, which is just a different, you know, I call it more of a Hamill-style way of writing JavaScript. And, you know, a lot of people loved it. A lot of people hated it. You know, a lot of people, you know, kept that pattern in their projects. So I think ultimately it's going to come down to what are people most comfortable with? Are they okay writing a little bit of JavaScript? And, you know, some people might say, I will not touch it. Yeah, and uh, I'm in both groups, <laughs> along with uh, haters and lovers of uh, CoffeeScript. I think you're completely right. Uh, that's something uh, that goes as a preference for anyone. And uh, uh, the more, the better. The more choice, uh, the, the better. And uh, I think it's a valuable project even for those uh, who are not able or don't like to use it in a production project. As I said, a great way to learn better the two languages and uh, something you can experiment and do funny things with, like uh, implementing Sinatra on Node and the kind of stuff which I, I've done a couple of times just for fun. Yeah. Uh, also, I'd like to mention for those old uh, Rails developers that we had RJS in Rails. And uh, RJS, uh, I think, was uh, a wannabe Opal. <laughs> I don't know if you remember it or know about it, but basically you were able to write Ruby in the controller and that that uh, translated to JavaScript in a very, very raw way. But the concept and the desire was there. So that's a, a fun fact to know about. And uh, something I, I think it's, uh, it tells uh, about, uh, about the need for this kind of project. Yeah, you know, really for me, I would have to wait until Webpacker support really came out before I could really give it a shot. So again, I'm really excited to see what you guys do in the next, over the next year. Yeah, I, I think it's worth uh, trying uh, with the current Webpack support, which is uh, used by, by many users in production. I know of, uh, it's fine. We just want to polish it a bit and make it official, but it's already supported basically. So I hope uh, that official support won't prevent you from trying it. I'm looking forward also to your feedback. I, I think you'll enjoy it uh, very much and uh, maybe uh, be a little surprised with uh, how easy are things and uh, how fast the implementation is. Because actually, I'm not the original creator of Opal. So uh, I'm not trying to get some merit about that. All goes to the original creator, and but uh, the concept, the initial concept, was really, really good. To kind of jump back to the tech side of it, what kind of speeds are there with compiling Ruby into JavaScript? Is there a lot of overhead, whether it's a CPU or memory or just time, or is it pretty quick? Yeah, it's pretty quick, uh, and basically uses the same uh, parser as uh, the famously known Rubocop, and that parser is called the parser. It's a gem that supports uh, basically all the Ruby versions. Some years ago, we, uh, we used to have a home-baked uh, parser, a similar and forked from the MRI parser. But with time, that, that's a, a big thing to, to digest, to keep up with the new syntaxes and to write the parsing and the lexing uh, for those that knows uh, about compiler stuff, uh, we basically switched to the parser gem. And so you can expect basically the same times you have with uh, Rubocop more or less without the autofix. Other than that, Ilya Bilic, uh, uh, which uh, contributed for some years now, 
and is now switched to supporting the parser gem and working on it. And who I thank very much for the great work he has done on Opal. Also wrote a um, lexer implemented in C just to speed things up a little bit. It will not add so much uh, over it to your assets precompile or webpack. It's uh, basically similar to any other compiler. And how is the support with keeping current with different Rails versions? You know, for example, I know a lot of libraries out there, let's just kind of pick on Devise, for example. Devise does a great job with keeping up with new releases of Rails as far as when a new beta or release candidate is announced, they usually start pushing into or merging into master the fixes or breaking changes that that new version of Rails has. But they are kind of slow to release the actual official gem that would support beta or stable new versions until like a week or two after the release. At least that's just kind of been my experience in the older device days. How's Opal keeping up with Rails and new releases? And does upgrading Rails cause a lot of issues if you are using Opal? About uh, race releases, uh, uh, that's, um, at least uh, unless you're using Webpack, then you, you will just use uh, the Webpack, Webpack uh, loader for Opal. But speaking of um, what we have as uh, Opal race, I still have to release the official uh, race 6 uh, version. But I think I uh, will be able to do that in not too long times because the, the setup is uh, really, we have a very small race. Um, I don't know if you know about the one file race version, in which you have uh, the whole uh, race app within one file. So we have race apps uh, for each version and it's uh, quite easy to, to add the support for race six. I, I still have to ensure it works uh, apart from the webpack uh, thing it still has support for uh, for their application and um, and sprockets i still have to complete that but i think it will come out in, in a few weeks maybe so i have five kids and uh, i struggle with time as anyone does uh, so i hope uh, i'll be able but don't take the those uh times uh, as to sure let's say don't hold your breath yeah i was gasping because i know what it's like raising three little kids i could imagine five i'm already outnumbered as it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> outnumbered is a great description <laughs> hi i'm a little late to the party um this is nathan it looks like you linked um, some awesome opal stuff in the in the show note or the the chat doc but I'm wondering if you've touched on frameworks like Clearwater yet, which is an Opal-based, essentially uh, React replacement that boasts faster render times and faster performance than React itself. Yeah. No, we didn't mention any, uh, apart from uh, HyperStack, uh, any other frameworks by name. But uh, yeah, Clearwater is uh, one of them. And it's uh, also very focused on performance. So I think I saw some some benchmark from James uh, mentioning faster render times than React. I think it was a couple of years ago. I'm not sure, but that's a great testament to the great work he, he has done and uh, also to the potential that uh, this technology has uh, along with the clean way that the framework presents itself. Another uh, framework I used, I actually used in production uh, with, the, I'm say with the Clearwater, I just did some experiments just to try it out. But I used uh, Inesita, which is another one in production. And uh, that's basically another vir virtual DOM implementation. It's a super tiny and minimal framework. And that's why I picked that up. And uh, it was really easy. We use that to build a bunch of uh, Solidus backend admin uh, that were customized for clients. Basically, uh, we were able to have different uh, UIs based on the client just by using that with a few components 
we solve basically solve the problem. I think uh, there's uh, of course uh, Hyperstack, and there's another one from a girl from Japan that's called uh, I'm not sure the pronunciation. That's called uh, Hialite. Hialite. I think it's also virtual DOM based. Well, uh, there must be a bunch of others uh, along with. Um, with my attempt to es- extract the one I was mentioning before uh, that uh, was similar to Stimulus, uh, I published it, uh, but it still needs some polishing. It's called Reactive, something like that. Uh, maybe I'll post you uh, the link so we can add that to the show notes. We have uh, on the site the, an, uh, an awesome uh, Opal list which has a bunch of frameworks and wrappers and implementations. So if anyone wants to I find out what their favorite is. That's the right place. Yeah, I'm not sure about uh, Dave or Andrew, but in terms of how much you've played with Opal, but Opal is, it, it, I mean, I know we have UJS and some tools that help us kind of avoid writing some JavaScript, at least, in, uh, especially with Rails. But Opal, like writing Ruby and watching it run in a browser is like pure magic. It is when you, the first time you do it, you just cannot believe it. It worked. It's so fantastic. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. I'm wondering if the Opal community has made any inroads with DHH, because I know he expressed some objections to making it part of the rails stack proper. Is there like a PR campaign? Are you guys working to to be integrated with frameworks like rails? What's the story on that front? I'll start with the current status uh, is that we we are uh, completely integrated. Uh, I think we talked at length uh, about Webpack support and uh, Sprocket support is there uh, since uh, I think 2013. I should know because I wrote, I wrote it. But other than that, uh, there's a little funny story with a Twitter exchange about this in which um, basically someone, I, I don't think I was, but basically someone suggested to DHH, uh, why don't you use uh, Opal? Why don't you endorse it and include in Rails? That makes sense and seems uh, uh, yada yada. So they tried to push it with uh, DHH and uh, the response was uh, basically, oh yeah, but uh, that's Ruby. It's not Ruby with active support. In response to that, we wrote Opal active support I don't think that was the real reason because otherwise uh, we would have uh, Opal as the official uh, race jam for front-end code. But was uh, indeed funny and I ended up using uh, Opal Active Support in production because uh, I think we all agree that uh, dot .present is, uh, and dot .blank is uh, very useful from time to time. I, mean, I think the real answer is that Basecamp doesn't use it, so it hasn't been extracted and moved into the Rails core. It's kind of a joke, but... <laughs> no, well, I mean, there, there's a lot of truth to that. One of the wonderful things that, that Opal provides the Ruby community, though, is, uh, you know, it's another implementation that's sitting on top of Ruby spec. And, you know, the MRI implementation of Ruby doesn't necessarily, is not driven by uh, Ruby spec, but it's, it's at least uh, maybe, I don't know, at least Ruby spec is teased out of that, right? And, and all of the Ruby implementations are then kind of beholden to that as the canonical representation of the feature set of the language. And so Opal's existence alone improves the community. Yeah, we we contributed a bunch of things to Ruby spec. And uh, one of the main thing uh, when you integrate with some libraries, uh, multiple strings, uh, that's, um, I think, the main difference uh, that, hits you when you try to run something on uh, on Opal if it's a pre-existing code. But yeah, I, I can testify that uh, it's been uh, of mutual benefit uh, relying on Ruby spec. Also, I think uh, they're running it uh, regularly and uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's also included as a sub-module within the Ruby uh, repository. So uh, they endorsed it uh, after uh, the initial, uh, we have our 
unit spec, uh, unit tests, and you have your spec, uh, we can run it, but we are not endorsing it. It's uh, kind of official. I see the the builds running in uh, Travis from time to time. So it's come to be one of the tools used by Ruby Core to develop the language. I agree that the more implementations, the better. Well, we add diversity. One more thing about that is that that particular to Opal is that we are not in direct, let me forgive this uh, word, direct competition with MRI because we are uh, running on a completely different platform. Maybe the some kind of competition will be with a compiled and script and compiled version of uh, MRuby, but I don't think that's, uh, that's a match for Opal uh, right now. Another funny thing I found, speaking of uh, MRI, I found recently is that the Try Ruby page is now based on uh, Opal. And they went through a bunch of uh, releases uh, during the years from the initial uh, wide the lucky stiff implementation uh, up to this one. Uh, I didn't know about, I came to it uh, by, by chance from following a link and uh, was really glad to see that in the official uh, Ruby organization. Okay, one question. Um, Forgive me if you've already addressed this because I joined a little bit late, but uh, if I choose to use Opal in a project, what type of penalty or is there one that I would pay? Like, is there, in terms of payload that may transfer over the wire down to the client, is the the bundle size going to be bigger that goes over the wire or is it still pretty small? No, it's still uh, pretty small. As I said, if you include the whole core library and standard library, still very acceptable. The sizes I see flying around for TypeScript, uh, uh, ES6 uh, apps compiled uh, with uh, Webpacker in, are in no way, let's say, smaller. The overhead that we'll add, it's uh, super tiny. But if you're really concerned about that, you can strip things you don't need away. That's a bunch of things in, in the core library uh, you not necessarily use, uh, I don't know, OpenStruct, for example, if you don't use it. That's in the standard library. But anyway, that, that's a bunch of things you can skip. Other than that, there are some trade-offs you will have to make. For example, if you bring in any external library or a plugin, you'll have to find a way to call it from Opal. There's a bunch of ways perfect uh, Ruby fashion with uh, three or four ways to call JavaScript from, from Opal. One of them is to write a wrapper for the library, but you can also call, the, um, call it as you, as you will do in uh, CoffeeScript with backticks. And we also have a special uh, .js with uh, both letters uh, in upcase .js syntax that will... Um, direct the call directly in, uh, to JavaScript. There's a bunch of ways to overcome that. But of course, you're dealing with a different uh, language and uh, there will be times in which will be easier and others in which uh, will be a little harder. But if you watch the different, different ways you can go and pick the, the right one, you'll probably be fine in, uh, in any case. Yeah, we, we used to call a bunch of uh, jQuery plugins and uh, libraries. Uh, uh, recently, did the presentation at the Ruby conference uh, here in Italy, in which I wrapped the Vue.js within a, a single line, I think. Uh, it wasn't in any way a complete wrapper, of course, but I was able to do the basic calls and uh, was mostly for fun. Just to say that... Uh, that's the other uh, uh, bump uh, you run into, just to, to know. And the other thing, I, I already mentioned that, but the other thing would be uh, knowing the DOM. So if you're coming from a place uh, in which you just know Ruby and uh, always set down Rails, uh, it's, uh, you, you must know that you're going to a different domain and you can avoid uh, knowing something about the DOM and uh, how the browser works, uh, go and look up documentation on 
Mozilla developer network and that kind of stuff uh, uh, it's still needed. So you, you're just using a better language, but uh, the environment you're in, it's still the browser, which makes for, of course, a bunch of fun and uh, some refreshing uh, approach to the, the language. And uh, that's also something I really enjoy to break out from usual race coding, in which you have to work with uh, active break or then views and controllers. And uh, I, I won't say that's boring in any way. You still can have fun and do your object-oriented design, but having a whole new domain to explore, it's uh, really enjoyable. That makes well, cool. sense. It's not, yeah, it's not unlike uh, Ruby Motion or something like that. If you're going to develop mobile apps, right? You're in a new domain. You have to learn the APIs that are available to you. That's that's pretty reasonable. Yeah. Was well, there anything else that we should cover with Opal? I'd like to do a little mention to a now basically dead project, and a call for anyone who wants to resurrect it because it was so cool. Maybe some some of you remember it. It was called the Vault Framework it was basically something like Meteor JS for Ruby. It was really cool. There, there's a bunch of talks uh, and the, on the interwebs uh, that you can look up and and see how great it was. I would really like to see someone take that that up and get that back on on track. I will do it myself if I had another 36 hours a day. But <laughs> of course. Uh, for now, it will stay in my wishes. All right. Well, I like, if people want to find you online, where should they look? I'm Elia, almost everywhere. That's uh, E-L-I-A. Uh, really easy to find. Uh, that's uh, everywhere. Uh, and you'll find the link for my site, uh, which I plan to start blogging again. I stopped in 2013, but I recently refreshed it and... Uh, I was also thinking of starting a, a small uh, newsletter for front-end Ruby with Opal with uh, some tips and that kind of stuff. I really enjoy newsletters like uh, Ruby Weekly and that kind of stuff. And so I think uh, we should uh, do something like that for Opal as well. So, and uh, I recently put a, a subscribe uh, form in the footer of my personal site. That would be not an official uh, thing, but a personal one. And uh, I hope I will uh, receive some subscribers and start a little community there to promote uh, this uh, great technology. Awesome. We've been recording Ruby Rogue since 2011. And we've talked to a lot of people who have had a really deep influence, not only on the programming community, but also on the Ruby community. And as we've talked to these people, it's become apparent to me that we talk a lot about the things that make them interesting that they've done. But we don't really get into how they got into programming or how they came up in their career, how they got to be the person who invented whatever library or, or technique that they came on the show to talk about. And so I put together a show where we actually highlight these things. We talk to them about how they got into programming. We talk to them about how they got into Ruby, maybe how they got into Rails. We get a little bit deep into what makes them tick and why they are the way they are. And then we talk about what they're working on. We talk about the things that make them well-known or make them interesting. And a lot of times, it's the stuff that goes beyond the code that really makes these people tick and makes them the kind of people that we want to hear about. And so I put together a show called My Ruby Story. You can find it at myrubystory.com. And it's where I interview these people and just get the stories of these people and how they came into programming. So if you want to hear inspirational stories or get ideas on how you can actually advance your career, then go check it out at myrubystory.com. So let's go ahead and move into picks. Andrew, do you want to kick us off? Sure. So I recently got into the GitHub Actions beta, and I've been having a ton of fun with it. So that's my pick. I know it's not everyone doesn't have it yet, but I think it's a ton of fun to play with. They're releasing a lot of cool tools around it, and I think it's going to be really big once everyone gets their hands on it. So yeah. GitHub Actions. GitHub's been producing some great stuff recently, and this is just another example. Now I'm excited to merge some of the stuff you've been doing. Awesome. And Nate, any picks? Yeah, I joined the, the podcast a little bit late today, but I wanted to 
just kind of reiterate that Opal is incredibly cool. If you have not tried it yet, I would encourage all the listeners to to just give it a shot. It's it is very fun to play with. My pick today is Benjamin Moore paints. So I've been doing some home projects, and when I was in college, I used to paint homes, and there is a massive difference in quality in terms of coverage and the hide that you get essentially paint acting like caulk and the colors that you can get as well as how quickly you can apply the paint varies differently between brands and Benjamin Moore paints are something that we landed on with uh, my contracting group when I was painting homes and I've been using it on some of my recent home projects it is leagues ahead it's like choosing the right tool choosing a better tool, both in programming and in the real, you know, outside in the physical world makes a huge difference in terms of how fast you can work and the quality of your work. So Benjamin Moore Paints is my my pick for that. It's It vastly outclasses most other paints, in my opinion, and it's been making some of my home projects go very quickly and smoothly. That's awesome. I've always just used a really cheap paint and primer in one to cover up like defects on the walls and stuff. Probably not the best route. Yeah. yeah. We, we used to joke that, I mean, certain certain brands from certain big box stores uh, will either paint like uh, you're trying to paint with peanut butter or you're painting with water coloring, uh, or I mean, water with some food coloring in it. <laughs> yeah. And more is is vastly different. You choose a good good product and it, it, it changes the game. All right. And then, uh, Ela, do you have any picks? Yeah, I want to pick uh, the f- first thing, uh, TextMate. So I'm uh, an older Ruby guy and uh, TextMate has been a companion for more than 10 years and it still, uh, it still uh, holds water, in my opinion. I think in the Ruby community, we are almost uh, like two using it, but still uh, has a, a great way to, to be very Mac OS and also espousing the Unix uh, philosophy of having all the snippets and commands uh, done with uh, environment variables and in any language you want. In fact, most of the core commands are implemented in Ruby. So I enjoyed uh, during the years uh, adding my bunch of commands uh, to the bundle. And uh, the other pick is uh, a book I enjoyed recently. It's called Explaining Postmodernism by Stephen X. That's, I guess, uh, I enjoyed it, but it's probably something for anyone interested in philosophy or that kind of stuff. Probably not for for anyone, but if you're into that kind of uh, topic, that's a great book and goes back to two, three hundred years of philo- philosophy and reconnects to current days, uh, made clear a bunch of things about the current world that we live in that are actually stem from that, that kind of philosophy. Awesome. And I'll jump in with a couple of picks. My first, it's really just a concept pick, which I've really, really enjoyed. So I host a, a few different websites on AWS And I recently discovered the AWS organizations, which allows me to have multiple completely separate AWS accounts, which I usually split each project into its own AWS account just for separation reasons. But with the AWS organizations, I can take all of these separate accounts and then consolidate them under one bill. So I only pay one bill a month to AWS instead of like three or four separate small bills. So I've really enjoyed that. It just helps me keep my books in a bit nicer order. And that kind of plays on my second pick, which is Pingverse, which is a new uptime monitoring software that I've created. And it's now out and it's ready for use. So that's pingverse.com. Yeah, I think we're moving to that on Code Fund. Smart people. Like for the first 10 people that sign up and want their company logo on there, I plan on putting it down in the sites using Pingverse. So, awesome. awesome. Well, uh, it was great talking with you, and I think that's a wrap. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit 
C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.